Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to our presenters and to everyone online who has logged in to the sixth International Conference on Big Data for Official Statistics. I would like to welcome you. It's an honor for me to be the moderator of the session. My name is Gordon Reichert, and I am the Senior Scientific Advisor for Remote Sensing and Geospatial Analysis at Statistics Canada. This is session eight entitled Use of Satellite Data for Agriculture, Environment and Oceans. We have six presenters, 90 minutes in total for all of it with Q&A. We've broken the presentations up into two parts. We will have three presentations, then a 10 minute Q&A after that. And then we will have a second set of presentations using the same format. With that, I would like to begin with our first presenter, Shai K. Fen. Shai is the Director of Information Technology Division and Chief Statistician of the Department of Rural Statistics, NBS China. He joined the National Bureau of Statistics of China in 2006. He served as Director of Information Technology Division and is now the Chief Statistician of the Department of Rural Surveys of NBS China. He is in charge of methodology and information technology application, data administration, research, modern crop survey equipment and procedures research. Early in his career, he was in charge of the crop acreage measurement with remote sensing technology. His expertise is on data processing, questionnaire design, and remote sensing applications. He has his license for fixed wing and multi-rotor drones. Dr. Kai Fen, the floor is yours. Kostat, would you cue the presentation? Uh, proceed with the second presentation and come back to the first one once we resolve some of the technical difficulties. Um, permit me to bring up the second presenter. It's uh, Dr. Kerry Mengerson and Dr. Yacinta Hallow Brown. Uh, just one second here, if I may. Hello, I'm Jacinta Holloway-Brown. I'll be presenting with my colleague Kerry Mengerson about developing data science methods and capability for Earth observation analysis. Australia has been a key contributor to Earth observation research and is leading work about monitoring coral reefs, forests, water quality and agriculture. The organisations listed on this slide are only a selection of the groups that are involved in this work. Missing data is a canonical problem for working with satellite images. At any time, on average, 67% of the world will be covered by clouds. An example of this is the NASA cloud fraction product, which is the figure on this slide, which shows us that uh, the blue areas have been observed and the white areas have been blocked by cloud cover. So we can see that globally over the period from 25th of May to the 1st of June 2020 that a lot of the land cover was not observed by satellites. And this missing data problem exists even for the newer satellites, including Landsat 8 and Sentinel-2. Solving the missing data problem due to clouds is important because in order to monitor our land cover at large scales and frequently, we need to use satellite images and we need faster ways to fill in the gaps. Now, the reason that we don't use radar images, uh, which are made by shooting beams through clouds and then measuring how quickly they bounce back is because they are black and white images. So they don't capture um, the forest cover indices that we're interested in. And these images can also be very noisy because of atmospheric effects. It's also not practical to wait for the next clear image, particularly in tropical regions that have rainforests because there might be weeks or months of persistent cloud cover that is blocking our view. At QUT, Kerry Mangerson and myself worked with our colleague Kate Helmstead to come up with a new method for filling the data gaps in satellite images and also classifying land cover. 
And this method is called Stochastic Spatial Random Forest, or SSRF, and that was recently published in the Journal of Big Data. Our method is fast and scalable and accurate for classifying satellite images, and it uses a machine learning algorithm, Random Forest, as a base. It fills missing data gaps and has comparable performance with remote sensing approaches with the additional benefit that it quantifies the uncertainty of our classifications. So we get a probability of forest cover in addition to a classification. I'll keep the description of our SSRF method brief. If people are interested to know more detail, you can find our paper in the Journal of Big Data. So in our approach, we start with a satellite image. We then calculate a measurement of greenness and DVI, which shows us where forest cover is. And then we create class variables, in this case, forest and not forest. We create training data sets of the observed uh, parts of the images to train random forest models. And then we get probabilities out of the random forest models. From these probabilities, we then construct a probability distribution or a beta distribution. And based on the values of that distribution, we then get probabilities of land cover for our missing parts of the images. So to interpolate missing values due to clouds in our image at T plus one, we use random forest results from uh, the two previous images that are observed. Our case study site is in June, which is in Queensland, Australia. So you can see this is the map of Australia. This is Queensland and the area in June, which our satellite images are taken from, are here. These are plots of forest cover in green and not forest in grey from two smaller areas within the overall in June site at pixel scale. And to validate our method, we simulated our own cloud patterns uh, independently of the land cover data. And we can see that we've done this for multiple dates as well. These are just two examples. And we also did this for uh, neighborhood scale data, which is smoother. This is an example of the types of results that we get from the model. And I've plotted these by latitude and longitude so we can see where they are in space. And this is a sample of 20,000 pixels that were missing and taken at random. So we can see that uh, the pixels that have a high probability of forest are in light blue. Those with a low probability of being forest are dark, very dark blue. And then there are gradients in between. So 0 0.5 is a lighter blue as well. To summarize the overall results, the SSRF method can accurately interpolate missing data when land cover is relatively stable over time. However, when significant change occurred between the images, the SSRF method tended to have lower accuracy. The measurement of uncertainty or the probability for the interpolated values is an advantage over other interpolation methods. And the SSRF can also be implemented as a Bayesian updating scheme. Since publishing this paper, we have extended the SSRF approach to accurately detect change events by simulating forest clearing. Our method could extend to other challenges in environment, agriculture, and oceans using satellite images. Our method is one example of new developments in Earth observation analysis. There is opportunity for many different types of new methods and technologies to be developed in this field. I will now pass over to Kerry Mangerson to discuss more on this point. Thanks, thanks, Jacinta. We've been involved with the UN for over five years in their journey to develop research and training to enable the use of Earth observation data by official statistics agencies around the world. The journey has taken us from the initial steps of evaluating the use of satellite data for official statistics, led by the Australian Bureau of Statistics, to the current step of building the enabling platform and tools led by Statistics Canada. This puts us on the path to adopting this new technology in practice. All three steps of this journey have required research and review, case studies and pilot studies, and training. 
This photo was taken at our short course at the UN Big Data Conference in Bangkok in a few, year, a few years ago. Perhaps you recognise some of your colleagues. The focus of our group is on the development of data science tools to analyse EO data. We now have a wider range of tools to enable us to manage and display EO data, to identify and describe features of interest, such as the presence of forest clearing and agricultural crops. And as discussed by Jacinta, we have a growing array of tools that take us from identification to estimation. And research is focused now on taking this a step further to prediction. The horizon is prescription, where the estimates and predictions are fed back to farmers, managers, and policymakers to make proactive decisions about what data to collect, what information to extract, and what further predictions to make. But our research doesn't stop there. We are also developing statistical methods to combine EO data with other data sources from mobile phones, citizen scientists, social media, virtual reality, and so on. We're learning to do this not only in the context of forests and agriculture, but also for monitoring our ocean treasures such as the Great Barrier Reef, all with a strong focus on addressing the UN SDGs. So we've come a long way, but we still have a long way to go. This is a call to arms to help us in this journey. As part of this build stage, we need your input into collaborative research to develop appropriate methods and software, information about successful use of EO data by official statistics agencies that we can share as case studies to inspire and inform others, information about training material and short courses about all aspects of the EO pipeline from acquisition and management of the data to data analysis and communication. And also we need early adopters of the UN platform to lead the way to the next stage. Please contact us if you can help with any of these. Individually, we can walk along this journey, but together we can fly. Thank you. Thank you, Kerry and Jacinta. Due to a technical difficulty at the beginning, a minor one, uh, I will introduce the two speakers since they've already given their presentation. Dr. Kerry Mengerson is a distinguished professor in statistics at the Queensland University of Technology in Brisbane, Australia. She is the deputy director of the Australian Research Council Center of Excellence in Mathematical Frontiers and the director of the QUT Center for Data Science. Kerry is also an elected fellow of the Australian Academy of Science and the Australian Academy of Social Sciences and a member of the Statistical Society of Australia and the IMS, ASA, RSS, ISBA, and ISI. Her research interests are in mathematical statistics and its application to substantive challenges in health, environment, and industry with particular focus on Bayesian methods. Dr. Jacinta Holloway-Brown is a postdoctorate fellow in the School of Mathematical Sciences of Queensland University of Technology in Brisbane, Australia. Previously, she was a research associate and PhD candidate in the Australian Research Council of Excellence for Mathematical and Statistical Frontiers, ICOMS. Jacinta's research has focused on, the de on developing open source statistical machine learning methods for analysis, uh, satellite images for environmental SDG monitoring. Jacinta has developed and taught hands-on workshops on machine learning methods for analysis, uh, for, for analyzing satellite imagery data for the United Nations and run these workshops in Bogota, Colombia, and Bangkok. She has also worked for the Australian Bureau of Statistics for years, more recently in methodology and tourism statistical roles. We will now move on to our third presentation and we'll come back to Dr. Kai Fen after. Uh, the third presenter is uh, Dr. Ken Bagstad, and uh, permit me to introduce him. 
Dr. Kim Bagstadt is a research economist with the U.S. Geological Survey in Denver, Colorado. He co-leads a team developing UN System of Environmental Economic Accounts for the United States and has advised other nations in the development of SIA accounts while serving on various international initiatives to improve implementation of SIA. Ken has also helped lead development of findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable data and models within the Artificial Intelligence for Ecosystem Services project for over a decade. Kostat, cue the presentation, please. My name is Ken Bagstad, and I'm going to be speaking today about the application of a tool called ARIES for the development of rapid and more credible ecosystem accounts under the system of environmental economic accounting. So the SIA, as it's called, for those who aren't familiar with it, is a UN-developed system that's designed to give a fully comprehensive view of the extent, condition, and the services provided by ecosystems in both physical and monetary terms. Critically, it's coherent with the system of national accounts, which is another UN designed system um, for tracking economic activity and accounts uh, consistently across the world. It's also connected to many of the other key global initiatives um, mentioned here. However, one of the um, key limitations in applying SIA at, at a really large scale thus far has been its heavy spatial modeling components. So this is very time and data intensive and requires quite a bit of expertise. So if we're to take the, uh, the long view of the development of global ecosystem accounts and other geospatial modeling, um, we can see that we've definitely made progress um, over, say, the last eight years since the SIA was first developed. However, the, the independent compilation use and institutionalization of accounts everywhere in the world uh, is a target that we haven't reached. And this is an admittedly high bar. But if we look to the future, um, based on our past experience, we can continue to make progress toward this goal. But I would argue we're still a fair ways off from it. And one of our interests with um, the tool, this tool called ARIES is to develop an approach that can really get us there much faster. So there's been an assumption in ecosystem service modeling, but I think in most geospatial modeling approaches that these are painstakingly slow approaches that take a lot of time, money, and expertise. The conventional model is to throw a lot of money and time at a problem, to have a GIS analyst and other experts working away and developing either your accounts or the results of your other models, and ultimately, hopefully, putting their results in a data repository. So there's an assumption that we can't have accounts that are high quality and quick and relatively inexpensive. However, um, with new technology um, and approaches from the semantic web, I would argue that this is no longer the case. And if we can more successfully and on a larger scale have experts contributing their knowledge, data, and models to the semantic web, which is a collection of linked online resources that a computer system can automatically access and integrate, we should be able to do all this in a much faster and cheaper way. So this is what ARIES is all about. Um, and we'll hear a lot from many approaches to, that use machine learning and um, specifically neural networks and deep learning. Um, some of the some of these areas of AI have been really heavily used and have made some real breakthroughs in recent years. But I'm going to talk about an area that may be less familiar called semantics and machine reasoning, which is really the guts of this system and is another key AI tool. In fact, um, some of the leaders in AI for scientific modeling argue that semantics are actually the key tool because what they do is they provide a consistent language for computers to understand and recognize data and model elements. And without these, we can't hope to have computers automatically assembling and reusing data and models on their own. So what ARIES does is it takes a series of what's called reasoning algorithms and decision rules that are designed to provide a computer with a way to make decisions about how to assemble data and models. We have open data and models that have semantics that work in a multidisciplinary manner with these reasoning algorithms and the open source software to support them. And what that all enables is 
ideally fast, fair, and multidisciplinary modeling. And fair in this case which refers to findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable data, which is pretty much the gold standard these days for, um, for modern data science. But for which um, the interoperability and reusability, especially in an automated way by computers, has so far eluded us. So with the coming together of these two worlds, um, the AI and machine reasoning and the CAEA, uh, our aim is to be able to produce rapid and standardized ecosystem accounts. So we want to support the adoption of the CAEA as a statistical standard by providing a faster and better way to do this anywhere on Earth, even in data-scarce countries or countries that don't have a lot of technical expertise. And we do this by providing a set of global models that run on global data and that can be run easily anywhere in the world, but also a way to more quickly and easily customize them wherever we have better local data. So it's global, but it's also automatically customizable. Um, there's an automation of the production of maps and accounting tables as part of this. And this is a project that just began earlier this year, but which we're rapidly ramping up. So the aim here really is to produce a global knowledge network for ecosystem service data and models. And these are the data and models that could underlie a lot of other um, geospatial modeling approaches beyond um, ecosystem services as well. But essentially what we have is global data and models that could run anywhere on Earth. We have time series data that go back to 2000 or even earlier. And then the ability, to, as I said, to replace global data by local data wherever possible. Aries for CAEA has a custom web interface, so the user, when they're running the application, will pop open their web browser and automatically be able to select which accounts they want to compile, which indicators they want to compile, and how they want to aggregate those. Also, what years they want to compile the accounts across. And the system will go out onto the web, search for the needed data and models, and um, run them and return the results for the user, um, all in an automated fashion. So as a few quick examples of this, um, we, we have ways to model ecosystem extent using some of IUCN's most recent work on global ecosystem types. This is a very new approach, so there aren't any standardized global maps yet, um, but we've coded in 25 of the different ecosystem types using global models. And these can, as before, be replaced with local land cover data sets. We can also use annual uh, or um, or multi-year um, land cover change data to look at how ecosystems are changing over time. And this is an example of um, the ARIES web browser where we've run a model of ecosystem extent for Nepal, a fairly data scarce place using global data. And we completed the estimate in about a minute. Similarly, we can examine ecosystem condition and this is a standard method that's being developed to look at um, forest ecosystem condition in this case pulling down ndvi data off the web um, which has to do with um, forest greenness comparing that to ndvi in protected areas and mapping out um, the condition of forest in a quartile method and as before, this is done in minutes on a web browser using cloud-based data, and it can be done anywhere on Earth. Finally, we model ecosystem service supply and use, and in, these are some quick examples of modeling and mapping carbon storage and sediment regulation. We have other services as well. And of course, when a system is automating all these processes and using artificial intelligence to do so, it's important that we're able to very transparently report on what choices were made along the way. And so ARIES includes a data flow diagram, which I, um, which I show here, where we can see um, the different <coughs> steps in the processing pipeline. And when you click on e any of these, you get information about the underlying data sets that were used, information about the algorithms that were used at each step of the process. And in addition, ARIES also produces an automated report, um, which shows the methods, um, a description of what's been calculated, the results, and any caveats associated with it. So there's a, a high degree of transparency that goes along with this automation and describes what choices were made and why. Finally, thinking toward the future, uh, we're continuing to expand this work for supporting ecosystem accounting on the UN Global Platform. 
But um, there's quite a few features included in ARIES already, including the ingestion of remote sensing data, the ability for experts to contribute data and models, but also for non-technical users to use and gain from the system, and the integration of a whole variety of modeling paradigms into one um, sort of overarching linkable system. There are a number of um, possible applications that you can think of beyond ecosystem accounting that this could also support. And for those who are interested, I'm happy to, um, to talk more about those. And you can find more information about the project here, as well as some contact information below. And I think the key question with all of this is making the global community aware of the benefits of fully fair, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable data and models. And asking how willing are we to change our habits with data and model storage in order to achieve these benefits. And I hope I've shown some of those benefits today and that we're able to progress as a community um, using AI in a smarter way to integrate data and models in support of global goals. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Bagstad. We will go back to our first presenter. Unfortunately, we had a minor technical difficulty at the beginning, but it's been resolved. I've introduced Dr. Kai Fin earlier. Dr. Kai Fin, the floor is yours. Mr. Gordon Rickard, all participants, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning and good evening. I'm glad to be invited to introduce the brief working of Image Big Data application in agricultural statistics in China. I hope we can discuss the program DAO's plans for big data application with all the experts from the countries and organizations around the world. I would like to share to share my presentation in four parts. The first part is about main condition. We start a new research program about the application of remote sensing technology in 2003. We already pre prepared for the application of image data in agricultural statistics for more than 17 years. We write the methodology into our year report system in 2019, but there are still many problems needed to solve. We established a scientific average estimation methodology. There are three key characters in our methodology. Remote sensing do the best it can do. Sampling do the best it can do. Surveys do the best it can do. We founded a complete working foundation, including national covered satellite image with multi-resolution, more than 20,000 sampling villages, more than 1,000 pilots and drones in the whole country. The second part is about four key points of our application. We use digital land data to replace householding interview data for sampling, field surveyor supporting, crop classification, and so on, which can improve the objectivity of basic data, obtain location of sampling land supporting automatic area measurement. We use digital land data to build two kinds of field survey. The first is artificial field survey based on land data. The second is rapid field survey by drone. These surveys means expand the ability of our surveyors. They can finish big areas surveying by automatic navigation and the air measurement with survey app or drone. 
We try to enhance the quality monitoring ability. The surveying app can record all the operation step for every surveyors. This means they need to do their job more carefully. Indoor operators can amend their severe mistake based on high resolution remote sensing image. Remote sensing technology gave us spatial perspective. We can focus on data and issue overall. Then we can monitor growth and yield production timely based on remote sensing data. We in the sad part. I will show you some new research and experiments. We interpret grassland data by satellite remote sensing image and investigate big farmers or sampling land by drone. The recognition accuracy for the outdoor cattle by neural networking machine learning algorithm can reach 98%. Last year, we developed a new experiment about peak surveyors by image data based on camera monitoring image. The accuracy can reach 95%. We try to develop a United Operation, op operation app for field survey and drone survey. I, I will show you a video for the detail. Before the frame, the two pilots are checking the status of drone and flying environment. The drone is unlocked. Fifty meters height. The drone reached the gaming height already. Now start the route flying. Then it shows the process data processing. This step needed about 15 minutes. Forty-five minutes later, the the invest surveying is is finished. In the fourth part. I will discuss some uh, ch child situation and uh, our plan. When we come into big data era, we face new situation, which is digitalization, networking, intelligence. And the digitalization will change all industry, including our statistic job. So we acknowledge maybe we will face for transparent data consumption, data resource demand, data collection principle, data processing mode. The first uh, trans, trans, transferring is data consumption. Many experts gave the data consumption for us, but what is data? is still confusion. So we need to re recognize about data consumption. And then more, more and more data resource needed to involve in our daily job. We must collect more and more data. And there's a new data processing needed to build. So uh, in, in we need to build a new statistic surveyor procedure, which is real online 
networking job supporting system, which support our daily daily data processing by cloudy calculation, which will help us finish average measurement, crop classification, yield estimation automatically. Maybe we will build a new statistic system with combination of observation ability in the space, in the sky, and on the ground. So that's all. Thanks you. Thank you very much. Thanks for your patience. Thank you, Dr. Kaifen. We had a bit of technical difficulty with the live feed, so we had to resort to the pre-recorded message. As a result, we are going to adjust our schedule. The Q&A period that was going to follow these three presentations will be amalgamated with the last set of Q&A, and we'll have an open Q&A for all six presenters at the end of the presentation. That then takes us to our next speaker, uh, Lorenzo. And just permit me to get the right computer working here. Um, I'll introduce Dr. De Simone. Uh, Lorenzo graduated in forestry science in 2001 and specialized in earth observations during his research work at University of California, Santa Barbara, and at the University of uh, Federico. Naples and the University of Basilicata in Italy, where he obtained his PhD in agriculture engineering in 2006. For the last 15 years, Dr. De Simone, De Simone has worked for FAO in his capacity of earth observation expert in the field of land cover mapping, crop mapping, and agroecological mapping. He has been responsible for project implementation in Africa, the Middle East, and in Southeast Asia. He is currently working on the use of EO data for official agriculture statistics and SDG monitoring crop type mapping projects in Senegal, Uganda, and Lesotho using both supervised and unsupervised methods. Costa, would you please cue the presentation? Good morning, my name is Lorenzo De Simone. I'm a senior expert in Earth Observations and I work in the office of the Chief Statistician in FAO. Today, I'd like to talk to you about the partnership uh, between FAO and the UN Global Platform and how we are leveraging this platform to build capacity in Senegal in the use of Earth Observation data to generate official crop statistics. My presentation will focus on three main points, a brief overview of the FAO geospatial work more in general, then I will go into the details of the collaboration, and finally, what are the next steps. FAO has more than 30 years of experience in the development and use of geospatial data, methods and tools, ranging from national to regional and global scale applications. So examples are the AFRICOVER, which focused on the uh, uh, mapping of land cover in Africa. Uh, it was a multi-year program. Uh, Afghanistan, for example, uh, national land cover mapping. This is dated 2016, it's more recent. Lesotho national land cover mapping in 2018. Um, definition of agroecological zoning. Monitoring of agricultural stress index. SDG monitoring and reporting, and this is an example on uh, SDG 15.4.2, uh, Mountain Green Cover ETEX, uh, crop mapping and statistics, and more recently the development of the hand in hand geospatial platform. The work is organized and delivered to developing countries through projects and programs that are carried out in headquarters as well as in regional, sub regional, and national offices to ensure that the best practices and standards are adopted and implemented. And um, FAO presence in countries is almost global, so this allows us uh, to have this uh, country-oriented approach. The focus, of course, in our projects is on capacity building. So through a tight 
uh, engagement with stakeholders, gathering of requirements from them, building skills and co-creation of solutions. So the work together is carried out rather than just us implementing. Um, another key aspect of this is the data sharing, especially uh, with regards to in-situ data. And as a final result, is this is about building trust with countries. Of course, FAO achieves these results also through partnerships with public and private uh, entities, and especially uh, uh, within the geospatial sector. So we have established and formalized collaboration with the European Space Agency, with the NASA, with Google, with ESRI, with the University of Louvain and other universities, and more recently with the Big Data Group of UN, as we will see. So now let's dive into the details of the collaboration between FAO and the UN Global Platform. So first of all, the context of the collaboration is the EOSTAT project that was launched by FAO in 2020 with the scope of building capacity in Senegal in the use of Earth observation to generate agricultural statistics, both acreage and yield. Our main counterpart in the country is DAPSA, which is the Directorate for Analysis and Forecast of Agricultural Statistics embodied within the Ministry of Agriculture. And of course, we have also other stakeholders. Um, our implementing partner is the University of Louvain. The time frame is 2020. And the methodology is, is supervised classification of satellite images. So we work especially with Sentinel-2 data. And we use a software called Sent2Agri, which was developed by the European Space Agency. When it comes to the platform, this is where the collaboration starts. So we decided after uh, uh, an analysis of alternatives, we decided to partner with the UN Big Data Platform because of all the advantages that it provides us. And essentially, uh, uh, the, the UN Big, Big Data Platform uh, is hosting our solution. This is just a, a, a diagram. I will not go into the details of this but I would like to highlight the advantages that the platform provides, which is the storage and computing power required. Uh, it's optimized per for performance and low running costs, which is very important, especially for the sustainability. It's scalable, so we can reproduce the solution for more countries. It allows for secure hosting of country data, which is a very sensitive topic. It allows for sharing of trusted data, methods and algorithms, it can act as an incubator accelerator for innovations, and it provides a platform for final dissemination and visibility. In this image, we display the main actors and components of the project. So on the top left, we have the main actors, which is the DAPSA, as we mentioned earlier, the Center of uh, uh, Agricultural Research, the Center of uh, Ecological Research, and the National Bureau of Statistics. On the right-hand side, as input data, we have the Sentinel data and the Agri survey for the in situ data collection. And finally, we have the technology, so a combination of the Sent to Agri toolbox, where the classification algorithms and the image pre processing uh, is performed, and the UN global platform hosting the system. So, by the joint effort of those components, we can achieve the national agricultural statistics. How does the Sent to Agri work? So a, a brief introduction. Uh, it essentially is based on two phases. The first phase is the development of crop masks. This is done through uh, a random forest classification. So Sentinel-2 uh, time series data is pre-processed for the cloud removal and the smoothing and interpolation. Uh, in situ data is gathered or uh, um, pre-existing land cover maps are used to define crop and non-crop area. And finally, a crop mask is generated so that we know where the crops are for the ongoing season. The process can also be run using object-based analysis. The second step of the Sento Agri, that's where the crop type maps are generated. So reference data is gathered in the field, in situ data. The data set is divided into training and validation data. Uh, Feature information is extracted from the remote sense data, so top of canopy, NDVI, NDWI, brightness, and other EO variables. 
uh, a random forest algorithm is trained and finally uh, a, a, a model is obtained. This model for classification is applied within the crop mask and finally we obtain the crop type map and then we of course we proceed with the validation of this, of the product. Where are we with this, with this project? So in February 2020 we had uh, initiation mission to Senegal. In March 2020 we had the stakeholder follow-up and communication plan. In April 2020, we had the platform deployed on Amazon Web Services, so it's ready to go. And a big thanks to the UN Global Platform team. Uh, in June 2020, we delivered the first online training. And uh, finally, in July 2020, we, uh, uh, after engagement with stakeholders, finally there was the official nomination of the focal point within the DAPSA. So what are, what are the next steps? Next steps. So September 2020, we're planning to deliver a training on best practices on in situ data collection and georeferencing. October, November, the in situ data collection will take place uh, in Senegal. This will be led by DAPSA and the field teams. November, we're aiming at delivering a training on classification of the EO data, so the generation of the crop type maps and validation, and final extraction of crop acreage. December, January 2021, presentation of final results. And finally, in 2021, sharing the training material and results, of course, uh, through the UN Global Platform. Within the EOSTAT project, we've recently launched also a new activity as of June. Um, with the scope of carrying out unsupervised crop type mapping and generation of statistics. And our partner uh, in this exercise is the country of Lesotho, uh, and our stakeholders are the Bureau of Statistics and the Ministry of uh, uh, Agriculture. For the time being, the prototype is being uh, uh, developed using the Google Earth Engine platform, Python, and Jupyter Notebook. The main achievements as of July 2020 are the development of the methodological guidelines after a thorough literature review. And the methodology is essentially based on the use of NDVI harmonics and coupled with K-means clustering, uh, gathering of administrative level agricultural statistics from the Bureau of Statistics, which then help us to label the clusters with the correct uh, crop. This allows us then to finally generate the crop type maps and uh, uh, estimations of acreage at the administrative level and then uh, at the national level. And uh, jointly with this, we've also uh, developed a crop type mapping app, which is still in its uh, prototype phase. It's quite a simple interface, but allows the user to perform the mapping without coding. And the next steps, of course, are the validation of those results with in situ data from the country. So we're speaking to the country right now uh, to find a way to gather specific crop data at specific locations. Of course, we would like to uh, improve the app. So if there is buy-in from the country, we're going to uh, uh, certainly further invest into that direction. And of course, explore also the possibility to integrate this tool within the UN global platform. I thank you for your attention. And uh, I hope you enjoyed my presentation and I am available for question and further clarification. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lorenzo. We will move on to our fifth speaker, Juan Vietang. He is a geoscience specialist with a focus on forest ecology and natural resources management. He has worked with governments, NGOs, and development organizations in Vietnam and Southeast Asia countries on projects including GIS-based IT system development, forest ecology, biodiversity, carbon accounting, and climate change. The floor is yours, Viet Thanh. Kostat, would you cue the presentation? Hello and uh, good morning uh, from Hanoi, Vietnam. Uh, my name is uh, Viet Anh. I'm part of a, a research team at uh, East Bon Rare, Vietnam. Uh, so uh, about a years ago, we uh, conducted a, 
uh, uh, ASCAP uh, funded study on uh, piloting uh, ocean accounting for case study uh, provinces in uh, Vietnam. So in this talk, we uh, try to uh, um, present and uh, summarize uh, our uh, reason and finding. So uh, first of all, some background and why ocean account is important from a provincial perspective. Uh, Quảng Ninh is among the top five economic provinces in Vietnam. Its uh, UNESCO heritage site and the income from tourism in 2018 was about $1 billion. So we pose some uh, hypothetical question uh, to the uh, provincial government. Uh, what if uh, there is no more coral reef and uh, seagrass in the ocean? What if there is uh, less and less uh, mangrove uh, forest uh, along the coastline? And what if the sea is uh, heavily polluted because of human activity? Uh, given that uh, condition, uh, will the Quảng Ninh still uh, be a, a favorite uh, destination for tourism and uh, for the uh, uh, investment? Uh, we need to measure and report the ocean value, its contribution to the economy and its uh, environment condition. Only when the ocean cow is fully recognized, we could uh, start to include the ocean into the economic uh, planning more effectively. Uh, some uh, additional uh, statistics about the Quảng Ninh province. It's a uh, top five uh, province to contribute to the uh, state budget uh, revenue. Uh, for the last six years, the uh, annual economic growth rate is about 10%. The GDP per capita is double of the country average. It's one of the key provinces in the uh, regional uh, development plan uh, of the northern area. Uh, the coal mine production is about 80% of the national, thermal energy is 20% of the national, cement 15%. It's a very important province for sea transportation and uh, industry. Uh, the tourism, uh, as I said before, is about uh, $1 uh, billion a year. Uh, and this uh, map shows uh, how many uh, industry parks uh, we have in uh, Quang Ninh. Uh, for the uh, methodology, we follow the uh, guideline uh, provided by uh, uh, UN Statistics and uh, SCAP. We start by uh, collecting data on ocean and land uh, in uh, three main categories, uh, social economic, ecological service, and environment. Uh, we then uh, conduct uh, a series of uh, uh, calculation and uh, analysis uh, to uh, produce uh, necessary uh, accounting um, value for, for the uh, for the reporting. Among the set of uh, ocean account uh, indicator, we only uh, focus on uh, ocean extent and ocean condition. That is because of the uh, uh, limited uh, on uh, data availability. Uh, so uh, this is the data set being used for the study. Uh, most of them are coming from uh, stat uh, statistic or uh, previous. Um, uh, inventory in uh, Vietnam uh, for the uh, coral reef and uh, seagrass. Uh, we use the location map from uh, WCMC and uh, verify and enhance it with uh, some uh, in-country uh, scientific uh, research report. So uh, first step is mapping a drainage basin and a marine unit of uh, Quang Ninh province. We run the uh, hydrological watershed uh, model on the DEM of Quang Ninh and coming up with about uh, uh, 30 uh, basin. Uh, we then conducted a uh, flow analysis and tried to combine them into three main basin uh, that flow into the sea. Uh, for the marine unit, we adapted uh, from the map of uh, uh, environment and protection planning of the province. So the final product is a map of uh, three main uh, land basin and the marine units that are receiving water flow and pollution uh, from uh, those basins. Uh, so uh, this uh, diagram uh, summarize our method uh, to calculate the impact uh, from uh, land-based uh, pollution to the uh, ocean. Uh, first of all, by uh, overlaying the basin map with uh, land use map and uh, pollution, uh, uh, population map, uh, we can get uh, um, a table of uh, land cover area by category uh, for each uh, basin and uh, each uh, sector. So uh, from this uh, and using uh, like uh, uh, proxy uh, data uh, for the uh, like um, uh, 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 pollution rate, we can calculate the uh, 
uh, waste water uh, uh, estimation for the home province. Uh, from that, we can calculate the uh, waste water and BOD uh, for each uh, land basin. And uh, from that, we uh, overlay with the uh, marine map unit and we can calculate the uh, waste water and BOD uh, received by uh, each uh, marine unit. Uh, so, uh, this is uh, our initial uh, reason. On the first table, we have uh, five uh, pol uh, pollution uh, sources, or we call a sector that is uh, population, industry, agriculture, coal mine, and tourism, and it's uh, uh, breakdown uh, by the contribution. Uh, from uh, each basin and the second uh, table we have uh, uh, wastewater and uh, BOD uh, from each uh, sector per year. Uh, for this uh, further study will be required. So the uh, second part is the mapping of the uh, uh, ecosystem type on the, uh, on the ocean that is a protected area, uh, seagrass and coral. So some of the key issues identified from uh, ecosystem uh, mapping are uh, for mangrove uh, during the last 20 years, it's a uh, reduction about 25% uh, of the uh, mangrove area due to land cover uh, conversion for industry, uh, urbanization and uh, aqu aquaculture farm. Uh, for seagrass and uh, coral, uh, we have uh, very few uh, uh, systematic study uh, with uh, update uh, status. Uh, however, the uh, latest uh, uh, reason shows that uh, for seagrass in uh, Quảng Ninh, we have uh, three sites that have uh, lost 100% uh, uh, of uh, its uh, seagrass area, and the other three sites have uh, lost uh, more than 80% uh, of uh, the area. For the coral reef, it uh, reduced about 30% of the uh, species reach and about 70% uh, of uh, the area. Uh, the main driver uh, uh, for this uh, reduction are uh, aquaculture uh, and uh, construction and the use of uh, uh, toxic uh, chemical in uh, fishing. Uh, for example, uh, water sample in uh, 2007 at the uh, Koto Island have the uh, cyanur of uh, three to five times higher than uh, standard. Uh, also, uh, uh, some uh, uh, flash flush that uh, put uh, pushing uh, sediment into the sea uh, that uh, kill the sea grasses. So uh, this uh, table uh, shows the data from uh, uh, six uh, sea grasses size in Quang Ninh with uh, data from uh, 1995 and 2003. You can see that. Uh, for most of the size, the seagrass uh, 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 area is uh, reduced by 100% or, or more than 90%. Uh, for uh, coral reef, uh, before the year 2000, the total area of coral is about 465 hectares. Uh, that uh, is located at uh, uh, three locations, the Bamboon Island, the Halong Bay, and the Koto Island. Uh, in the uh, latest uh, survey in 2007, the coral is only remain in Koto Island and the coverage it, it's very spare, only from uh, 1 to 7 percent. Uh, after that, the uh, uh, mangrove uh, deforestation has been uh, slowed down. Uh, uh, for the last five years, only a few uh, hundred uh, hectares of uh, mangrove uh, has been uh, cleared. Uh, however, uh, due to the uh, new uh, economic uh, development plan uh, of uh, Quảng Ninh, uh, there will be uh, maybe a few uh, uh, several thousand hectares of uh, mangrove is uh, at risk. Uh, because of the uh, opening and expanding of a new uh, uh, in industrial park uh, near uh, Hai Phong. To measure the uh, ocean pollution, we borrow a data set uh, from the Vietnam Agency for uh, Island and Ocean. Uh, this data set has about 120 measurement points uh, that uh, is measured for both aquaculture 
and island with the human activity, uh, the uh, chemical, um, yeah, the, the, the chemical uh, uh, test uh, measure, including the uh, pH, uh, ammonium, oil, BOD, uh, TDS, among other. Uh, we then uh, analyze the result and compare it uh, with the uh, Vietnam uh, environment and uh, standard uh, for each uh, uh, each uh, chemical uh, characteristic and uh, based on that we be able to rank uh, each location as non-pollution, uh, high pollution and uh, medium pollution. Uh, the result uh, shows that uh, all aquaculture site is heavily polluted. Uh, that is site with uh, more than uh, three parameters above the ocean water standard uh, by the long marine unit is the most uh, heavily polluted among uh, seven uh, marine units and the source of uh, pollution is uh, very uh, broad, uh, it, uh, including both uh, polluted from marine boat, polluted from uh, tourist boat, polluted from fishing boat, as well as uh, polluted uh, from uh, human activity. The two small islands, uh, Bamun and Koto, that uh, include a marine protected area. It's also uh, heavily polluted by uh, human activity. Uh, to start, we will uh, collect uh, the data from uh, three years, from uh, like 2016 to uh, 2018, and we collect uh, the in four indicators, that including the number of uh, tourism, total revenue, uh, contribution to the uh, GRDP, and the number of jobs created by the aggregate impact of uh, farming uh, tourism sector. Uh, based on uh, this data, we were able to uh, calculate the uh, tourist uh, expenditure uh, breakdown by each uh, sub-activity. Uh, and we can see that uh, two uh, largest uh, activity are uh, food service. Uh, it's about uh, uh, 7,000.5 billion Vietnam dong and uh, accommodation service, about uh, 4,000 uh, billion Vietnam dong. Uh, from this, we can then uh, calculate the effect of uh, tourism on Quảng Ninh value added uh, economic in 2018. Uh, again, we see the uh, uh, three sectors with the highest value added uh, food uh, service, about uh, 3,000.5 billion Vietnam dong, uh, accommodation service and uh, uh, transportation service. Uh, in general, the uh, uh, tourism uh, contribute about 11% uh, of share for the uh, provincial uh, GDP. Uh, uh, of that, 6% uh, is direct uh, contribution and 4.3% uh, uh, is uh, indirect uh, contribution. Uh, the last activity in uh, this study is to calculate the uh, uh, wastewater discharge from uh, tourists in uh, Quảng Ninh uh, province. Uh, uh, for this, we use uh, a value uh, transfer method uh, that uh, citing the uh, um, uh, reason calculated by uh, a UNEP study in uh, uh, 1984 that have uh, uh, the uh, amount of uh, waste uh, discharge uh, for uh, uh, each uh, uh, tourist uh, uh, person. So uh, we uh, calculate it uh, for eight indicators like uh, COD, BOD, uh, TNTP, uh, NO3, uh, ammonium, uh, PO4, and uh, PSS. Uh, this is uh, one of the limitations of uh, this study. Uh, in the uh, context of uh, this workshop, we uh, actually uh, didn't use uh, big data or a lot of uh, data at all. The requirement for the accounting method uh, actually constrains the set of data that can be used uh, so that the selected data can be compared uh, in terms of uh, thematic area, uh, space, and time. Uh, we see that the uh, data availability and the option to estimate the indicator uh, from uh, GIS and remote sensing is uh, one of the key issues uh, to be addressed. 
uh, for the more uh, effective uh, housing accounting study. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Vietan. We'll move on to Bruno Sanchez Andrade Nuno. He is the principal scientist at Microsoft AI for Earth, building the planetary computer. By training, he has a PhD in astrophysics. He's a rocket scientist by postdoc. Bruno has helped lead big data innovations at the World Bank Innovation Labs, served as VP uh, social impact at the satellite company Satellogic and chief scientist at Mapbox. Bruno has published the book Impact Science on the role of science and research for social and environmental impact. He was awarded Mir Zayan Science Policy Fellow uh, of the U.S. National Academics of Science and a young global leader of the World Economic Forum. Now, just prior to going to his presentation, uh, this is the last presentation. I would encourage you to put in your questions in the chat box at the bottom of the web page. And at the end of our Q, at the end of the presentations, we will have a quick Q and A, and we'll address some of the questions that have come in. Uh, Bruno, the floor is yours. Kostat, would you cue the presentation? Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Bruno Sanchez Andrade Nuno, and I'm the principal scientist at Microsoft AI for Earth. It is a pleasure to come back to this conference after a few years. I was here before wearing the hat of the World Bank. I used to work with some of the colleagues that are speaking in this conference, also on the use of satellite data for agriculture, environment, and um, socioeconomic development in general. But in this talk, what I want to talk about mostly the main message can be summarized in the book that just was released this week by Enrique Sala, which is The Nature of Nature. And he says, if we, if we take care of nature, she will take care of us. Also, the opposite is true, I think. If we don't take care of nature, many challenges, we will face many challenges. And this, this other way to, uh, to visualize in this cartoon. Today we are living in very unprecedented times with the crisis of COVID, but also we have the looming dangers of the recession and climate change. And behind that, I would argue biodiversity collapse. And these two things, biodiversity collapse and climate change, these are consequence of we not taking care of nature. So we have to take care of nature so that we don't have these problems of climate change that can turn back the clock of socioeconomic development that we can create, but also because of that idea of taking care of biodiversity also takes care and provides a lot of opportunities. There is this work that uh, the Nature Conservancy did that also highlights this interconnectedness of nature and um, socioeconomic development. They map these locations that they call the last chance ecosystems. And these last chance ecosystems, if you see the map of the world, they align very much with places that are, um, that are developing countries. So the, the relation between, or the interrelation of weak ecosystems, so, so speaking socioeconomically, but or speaking in terms of biodiversity is very strong and we cannot we cannot think of development in one area without thinking the, the consequences in the other and how what, taking care of the environment can also take care of, um, of socioeconomic development. There are many examples of, of both directions. Climate change is the, is the biggest one of when we don't take care of nature, but there are also opportunities and there are many examples, like for example, when we, when we create fisheries and we protect zones where we cannot fish, um, that the overflow of these regions end up creating more fish in the overall area than if you didn't have a protected area. So it's an example of how taking care of protecting biodiversity also provides an opportunity for more socioeconomic development. I can, I'm happy to talk about these issues later in the, in the Q&A. But let's talk quickly on big numbers of these problems of the planetary scale in terms of biodiversity. We only have 400 and 
20 gigatons of carbon remaining before the biggest tipping point starts to happen, according to the models. We know we have around 55% of people who lack access to sanitation water. We waste 1.5 gigatons of food every year, and 25% of species are threatened with extinction. So this is a huge, this is a huge problem. But at the same time, we live also in a times of huge opportunities. As this whole conference talks about big data, satellite images, but also um, the Internet of Things, and big computes offer a, an unprecedented opportunity to leverage all of this amount of data to create information to help us move. There's also market mechanisms that have proven to be extremely effective to create value. So this, this is the opportunity we face today. Um, at AI for Earth, at the program at Microsoft, the, we have helped more than 613 uh, grantees, uh, researchers and NGOs in around 90 countries to access the data they need to, to make their studies of, of agriculture and, and climate change and in general biodiversity, also to help them run the codes so that not only you need a PhD on the environment, but not even need to have another PhD in cloud computing. So we have helped them, but also we have, we have helped some companies do uh, projects at a global scale. And I wanted to talk about briefly about these ones that I would say also are under the umbrella of huge commitments that Microsoft um, has done, like for example, being carbon negative, uh, by by 2030, including the scope three, so not only direct emissions, but also indirect emissions, or the commitment to be waste-free by 2030, or to protect more land than it uses. These are huge commitments that uh, I believe also help uh, and hopefully inspire other companies or governments to, to have also these commitments of being carbon negative, like Bhutan is today, but also to protect and the land they use, or to, to have um, waste-free operations. One of the first examples I want to touch briefly is this company, iNaturalist, which allows anyone to take a picture of a species, of a plant, and then it tells you which uh, plant there is. But the trick here is that then all of that data is fed back in the background so that a governments, NGOs, and scientists can start to see what's the distribution of these plants, like for example, invasive species or not invasive species, and figure out what is the complexity and biodiversity of their environment. They have more around 3 million registered users with 44 million observations, and they observe uh, almost 250,000 species. And some of them have been rediscovered with this method. Um, there's also an example of wild knee, which is a similar approach to allowing people to take pictures of animals. That also allows them to have the, the range of the species, but also identify in a specific individuals. Like, for example, um, if the lion has moved to another place, or the whale or the shape of the whale has uh, is the same whale that you can see it in different places, you can see migration patterns. This is all, this is all uh, possible through these uh, AI systems to, to identify individual animals and species. But let's go to the core um, of some of the examples that um, we can use with satellite images. One is land cover mapping. We've, had, we've worked with the Chesapeake Conservancy and ESRI in this project where we had the data at very high resolution for the water set of the Chesapeake Conservancy. And it took 10 months and a million dollars to create these high resolution images. And the question is, how can we do that for the whole of the US or the whole of the world? We need this data. We don't have the, the amount of budget that it would require to do this at scale. So what do we leverage? We leverage um, and this is the 17 million people living in this um, uh, Chesapeake water set and 64,000 square miles. It's, it's, a ch it's a really big size, but we need it much bigger. And so, as I was saying, we use um, uh, deep learning mechanisms to do land classification training and then expose that training to new data and see how it correlates with the, with the places where we also have this super high resolution data so that we can use the same model in other places where we don't have this very high resolution model. Only with the medium resolution or low resolution, we can have this land classification. And this is an example on the top left. We have aerial imagery, but and in the bottom right, you see the classification. And go quickly to some examples. 
and this is another company, Silvia Terra, who was um, able to map the entire um, 92 billion trees of the US um, um, processing 800 terabytes of data, again, using satellite images, but also LiDAR images and to, pro to process 500 million acres. We have this opportunity to scale these uh, types of applications that we can define. And we've worked, uh, we've, we like to think about applications of classification, applications of forecasting, applications of planning and attribution. And we, that's why thinking in this, this way of how we can scale up these opportunities with satellite images and AI, that's why Microsoft has committed to create a planetary computer to allow the planetary scale geospatial operations to support the examples that I had said before, but also many more coming from government, from scientists, from NGOs, putting together these amazing data sets, the infrastructure that is needed, and the models to, to allow app developers, data scientists, and everyone to use it. We are, round, we are out of time, but I love to keep talking about uh, possible applications or possible examples of this kind of data. So happy to go into, into questions um, to answer uh, opportunities or brainstorm and we can do one work together. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bruno. And thank you to all the presenters. We now enter the uh, last portion we have a reduced amount of time for q and A. I'll ask Kostat if we can perhaps borrow a few minutes from the break between the two sessions if there are additional questions. We've got a number of them that have come on screen. Uh, some of them have already been responded to via email. Uh, so that's encouraging. And what I would like to do is just bring up the list of questions that I have received here. The, uh, the first question comes from uh, Rike Monk Hansen, and it's to Mr. Ang. She asks, has there been any interest or use of the results so far by provincial decision makers? And what are your plans for further study? Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, so we have uh, initial uh, discussion uh, with uh, the province. So uh, in uh, Vietnam, uh, we have uh, the new law on the planning uh, uh, that uh, require we have the uh, uh, master planning uh, plan for own uh, province in uh, Vietnam in, in the next uh, uh, three years. Uh, before we have a separate uh, planning uh, for each uh, thematic, uh, thematic sector. So province is uh, interesting. Uh, to uh, include uh, this uh, also in the carving into the uh, planning uh, process. Uh, but uh, due to the uh, COVID-19 uh, situation, the, uh, we, we just been able to have uh, uh, initial um, uh, discussion and uh, we uh, expect to, uh, to work more. And uh, we currently have uh, another project uh, with the Quang Ninh province uh, to uh, further uh, uh, introduce and, and uh, integrate uh, this data in, into their planning. And uh, for the second question, could you could you repeat the second question again? Uh, I think. Let me unmute it now. I'll ask. The, I'll, I'll represent the second part of the question. What are your plans for further study? Uh, yeah. Uh, so uh, actually, we uh, uh, first study uh, we uh, uh, kind of uh, having uh, 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 time limited and uh, resources, so we don't have uh, access to uh, many of the data that uh, it's uh, required for this study. Uh, for example, the uh, uh, for the comp comparison of, of uh, land use. Uh, land cover at uh, two periods to access the, the chain condition. Uh, we have to uh, wait for the uh, 2020 uh, land inventory. So we didn't uh, been able to uh, to conduct a detailed uh, land use chain uh, matrix uh, using the uh, latest data. Uh, also, we uh, try to uh, um, in the future we try to include uh, satellite uh, data. Uh, 
or assessment of the uh, of the water condition. In this study, we uh, have like uh, more than 100 uh, uh, points that uh, sampling the, the uh, water uh, quality, but it's it's mainly in the near shore and and focus on on some specific area, and we uh, definitely want want to look at the uh, satellite base uh, indexes for for water quality uh, assessment. Very good. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Next question goes to Dr. Bagstead. Uh, the question is, may I know how many countries can provide 100% data for SEEA systems? Thanks. Well, right now, um, there we're, we're relying on global data sets, as I mentioned. And so we have um, quite a number of those that let us examine ecosystem extent, condition, and um, services. But generally, the, the philosophy behind our approach, which we call global but, but automatically customizable modeling, is that countries could rely on global data, yet can contribute their own data and keep that private if they choose to, or can share that with the world if they choose to, so that, um, so that the data ecosystem continues to grow. So I would say that, that right now, um, we're, we rely mostly on global data, but more countries are contributing data and the more do so, the stronger our accounts can get. Very good. Um, we have a, a question for Kai Fin. Is he online or I, I see that his, I don't see an image of him, so I'm not sure if he's online. I'll ask the question and hopefully he can respond. The question is, what is the most important component for a national statistical organization to build a new methodology in order to support image data applications for statistics. Okay, I will presume that uh, he's unable to respond to that. Um, I'm just looking at the time. We've gone over by one minute. However, I would like to leverage uh, or present a question to Carrie and Jacinta in a comment that you made or an open invitation that you made in your presentation. And that was, for others to participate if they would like. Carrie, how can they do that? Well, thank you, Gordon. Uh, we would really like to hear from people and there's been some inspiring um, presentations in this session about uh, research and also uh, the increasing the, the, the capability and the capacity to undertake uh, um, earth observation analysis uh, or analysis of earth observation data for official statistics and in particular for agriculture, environment and oceans. Uh, we'd like to hear from other people and about uh, their um, uh, products and uh, research and also training uh, courses. And uh, they can do that either through emailing us or through emailing uh, you, Gordon, through the, um, the, the UN task team. Um, or, and also Lorenzo is, is um, a part of that team as well. So um, the, the emails are part of the presentations. We'd love to hear from people. Perhaps you'd like to expand on that, Gordon, given that you're leading this task team. Are you on mute? I, I, was, I was just saying it was not a baited question. Uh, you had opened the invitation to others, and I'm sure there are many that are eager to participate. We have two components within this. One is a training session working towards uh, e-learning uh, courses that would be accredited. And Carrie and Jacinta and others are handling that portion of it. And then there's also a component that's uh, looking at using supervised unsupervised classifications for land cover uh, as part of SGG monitoring. So again, we invite anybody to contact us, uh, either call us or, or give us, uh, send us an email is probably the best way, and we'll get back to you and we can discuss this further with you. Uh, we are out of time, unfortunately. There are a number of questions that unfortunately we've been unable to get to. I wish to say a thank you to everyone again. We've had some very dynamic presentations, a wide range of topics, and it's been most pleasant to be the moderator for this. Uh, I congratulate you all and thank you everyone from whatever part of the world you're in, whatever time of the day it is for you. Thank you for being with us and sharing and participating. One last thing, there will be a 10 minute break before the next session begins. 
So COSTAT, for, the moment, for, for my part as moderator, I call this session eight closed. Back to you, COSTAT. Bye.